You're listening to EdTech Heroes, a podcast that looks at how teachers in today's classrooms can use technology to improve student learning. In each episode, a hero in the world of education will share their story and discuss how innovation can influence the minds of the next generation. Let's jump in. Hey y'all, and welcome to Ed Tech Heroes. I'm Neff, and today's guest is Ron Carroll. Ron is the Manager of Instructional Technology at Chicago Public Schools, which is the third largest school district in the United States, with more than 600 schools providing education to over 340,000 kids. Ron holds two degrees from the University of Iowa and has held several technical coordinator and instructional technology positions across the Chicago area. And last but not least, Ron was also a panelist on a recent Screencastify webinar focused on how video can empower assessment of student learning. Ron, welcome to Ed Tech Heroes. <laughs> Thanks, Neff. It's good to be here. <laughs> oh, man, it's really good to have you. So you were just in yeah. this really, really awesome webinar where you talked a little bit about this idea of practice making permanent and practice being a very, very important part of your daily life. Can you talk a little bit about how that mindset informs your philosophy when helping teachers integrate instructional technology in their classrooms? Yeah, I mean, it is all about mindset. You know, I, I used to say, and still occasionally do, that exposure isn't mastery mm. to remind us that, you know, tech PD shouldn't just be a one and done sort of thing. But the more I've thought about that, that really comes from a deficit mindset, right? Like it's pointing out the, the problems without providing a solution. But the phrase practice makes permanent is powerful. It's like a joyous reminder that we can change, that we can improve. We just have to put in a little work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's true of all aspects of life. <laughs> so I love gardening, but I kill so many plants every year. And it's not on purpose. And for a long time, I always saw that as like a failure of me. I just wasn't a good gardener. But over time, doing it more, you learn about, you know, soil mm -hmm. conditions and, you know, the, the concept of right place and the right plant in the right place. And so now I see those sad plants as an opportunity. <laughs> Technology is just like that, right? It's, you, you know, you start trying something and it doesn't work. And so you try something else and, and then that does work. And then from that, mm -hmm. you can think back and make that other thing maybe work again. And uh, yeah, so practice makes permanent. I think it's, it's a cool way to look at the world. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, however, that there are lots of teachers who are a little bit hesitant to practice anything, whether we talk about technology or not. And that's not because those teachers don't have a growth mindset or don't want to improve their practice, but I think that it is a very real fear that you engage in a vulnerable lesson that you attempt to practice, and that's exactly the day that your principal walks into the room and is ready to complete your formal evaluation or somebody else oh, walks yeah. in and they get the impression that you are a poor teacher. So in your position specifically, I'm curious how you reconcile that to help teachers understand that practice is important while also understanding that they might be really fearful of perhaps ending up with a dead plant. Oh yeah, no, I mean, fear is definitely a very powerful, true emotion. And, and I get that, like, you know, even more than, I mean, obviously like principal walking in or, you know, maybe a district person walking mm -hmm. in or the internet goes down, right? Mm -hmm. like, these mm -hmm. things happen, you know, it's happened to me on stage giving a presentation and all of a sudden nothing is working. So I completely understand that fear. And it's, it's very valid and I'm you know, not discounting that in any way, shape or form, but it's one of those things that, again, it's, it's about that practice. It's doing it over and over again and starting with little things. Don't mm -hmm. jump into the deep end, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to make an instructional video. I'm going to learn 
Premiere Pro and After Effects, and I'm going <laughs> to make all the bells and whistles of like my favorite YouTubers, right? Mm -hmm. You start small and you practice that. You know, One of the things I say to a lot of teachers is just pick one thing. Pick one problem of practice that you're struggling with and, you know, work with your tech person, reach mm -hmm. out to me and let's, you know, come through and figure out that little tweak that you can make to integrate tech. And then the more you do that, the more it becomes permanent, it becomes part of your practice. And so then when your principal walks in, they're like, oh yeah, this is awesome. And mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe you end up presenting in other you know, <laughs> conferences and things. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. Or certainly. Not. Yeah. <laughs> but but I do think that that is a a really interesting nuance in terms of let's practice, but how do we break down really big changes in the classroom into small bite-sized chunks that we can implement one by one until we've realized this really cool transformation. I I really like that as an idea. Yeah. So you've talked yeah, I mean, about the same thing we do with our students, right? Right. You know, like you don't start by knowing how to write an amazing essay. You know, you learn about a paragraph, you learn mm -hmm. about, you know, introduction sentences. So teachers know how to do this with their students, but I, I get it. You're afraid to do it, you know, on your own <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. And that's why I'm sure. here to support. I'm here to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And that's, there's also something interesting in what you just said. I, I was an English teacher, right? So like that resonates with me all day, every day. And when I was teaching argumentative essays, I'm scaffolding. We're gonna talk about the thesis statement. We're gonna talk about the hook and we are gonna practice that until we get it down before we do these next elements of the paper. But what's interesting about that is when we scaffold as educators, we're kind of doing that work for our students. We are asking them to scaffold on their own behalf. So it's kind of interesting to have the metacognition to be able to say, okay, I'm going to break this idea down myself, perhaps without the aid of someone, or maybe with the aid of someone like you or someone in your office. So we've been talking a lot about professional learning and I've heard you describe getting to engage in professional learning as doing the fun stuff. So can you tell me a little bit about why you think that's so fun and what is it like to engage in professional learning throughout CPS, specifically around technology learning? Yeah, I mean, Obviously, everyone has different ideas of what constitutes fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I started this journey as a break fix tech guy, right? I was, you know, just out of school fixing broken things mostly, mm. which is fun in its own way. But then teachers started coming to me and they're like, okay, I want to try this thing. And, you know, my background was not education. And so mm. I then had to go in and learn all of these things from the teachers around me, you know, so it's. It's finding those areas of expertise and all celebrating each other and supporting each other, which I think collaboration is fun too. But really for me, the fun is good PD. And we've all been in bad PD, right? We all know what bad PD looks like. But good PD is, you know, getting in there and, and playing around and having the time and the space to, again, embrace those fears and try things in a safe place. Mm. which is what my team and I try to do with our PD is make it very hands-on and, and safe. You know, this is the time to make mistakes. It's easier to make mistakes in front of us and with your peers than it is in front of your kids or your principal. Sure. So to me, that's, that's fun. <laughs> I like playing. And <laughs> PD can be like play if it's, if it's done well. So PD providers out there, if you're listening, make your PD fun. It can be fun. <laughs> Certainly. And I'm interested a little bit in that because I think that you said something that is so true, that fun has very different definitions for different people. And yes. I have given lots and lots of professional development during my time here at Screencastify. And sometimes it goes off like gangbusters. People love it. Sometimes they don't. So I am curious how you all think about continuing to evolve professional development and make sure that it remains fun for 
what is thousands and thousands of educators throughout the district? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of those things like, you know, we as PD providers are also facing similar things that our teachers just went through, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's much more fun to be together in a space and have, you know, some food and, and you know, just sharing and, and talking, you know, I'm thinking about some of the all-day PDs that we've done in the past at CPS. You know, we're, we're, we have the benefit of going into, like, the Google offices or the Microsoft offices or the Apple offices. Like, all of them have offices here, and in the before times, we would get to go down there and, you know, bring a group of teachers and, you know, have this other space. And then the pandemic, and we're staring at screens, often just with all the avatars, you know, people having their cameras off, which again, I'm not making any argument pro or con having, you know, cameras on or off, mm -hmm. but it can be disheartening as the presenter to sit there and stare at that and you're not getting that same energy. And I know our teachers have been dealing with this for back and forth for the last almost two years now, right? So that is a challenge. And so the same things I would ask a teacher to do to bring engagement into their classroom with their students, I'm not going to not practice that. You know, I'm mm -hmm. going to try my best to do those, you know, those little tips and tricks to make it fun, hopefully. Obviously, I don't always succeed. I'm not going to lie. I've also had some really terrible things <laughs> myself. <laughs> you know? Thank you for admitting that. Thank you for <laughs> not leaving me alone in the island as the only person who has failed. But but certainly I do think that it is helpful to attempt to infuse some of these practices and to frankly practice what we preach. And then I think it is also really, really cool for educators to get the opportunity to sit on the other side of it and see how some of these instructional strategies are perceived as the learner and get an idea of how how it might actually work for their classrooms and the students that they get an opportunity to interact with. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And that's one of the things, you know, when we talk about bad PD, we hope and expect that, you know, these, these deep tech integrations that I know you care about that, you know, we've talked about, that they can be empowering and engaging mm -hmm. for our students. But then when we turn around and still just do that kind of sage on a stage sort of PD where I'm just like, lecturing or even worse, just reading the words off of the slide <laughs> at people, you know, we've all sat in those. Uh, how is it that, you know, we, and when I say we, it's, you know, the administration and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. saying, make your classroom more engaging, more tech infused. But then when you as a teacher come in for a learning experience and we don't model that, well, that's just, that's bad on us, right? Like that's not the way to learn. We all learn by example and, and by doing and by, you know, experience. And so, yeah, if we don't provide those experiences for our students, then what are we doing? And yeah. in this case, the students are the teachers. <laughs> for sure. And we've been talking a little bit about this idea of teacher feedback. And sometimes that feedback is around professional development, but I know that your office also cares quite a bit about teacher feedback around technology integration. What are teachers thinking about the tools that you all have made available? Are they working? Are they not working? So how do you go about getting feedback from thousands and thousands of educators about what they like and what they don't like? Yeah, I mean, in this, in in the scale of CPS, that is definitely a challenge. <laughs> and then, of course, this current moment in Illinois uh, is a challenge. We've got a new law that went into effect this year called SOPA, which is completely mm -hmm. changing the landscape. Changing the landscape. And given the scale of CPS, and honestly, the digital threats that every district faces right now, we do have to be careful about the tools we choose. Mm -hmm. But teacher feedback is crucial. Like I can, you know, I can love something, but if a teacher is never going to use it, then what's the point of investing in it or, you know, either training wise or financially. So that is very important that teacher voice, you know, we, we do random surveys from my mm -hmm. team 
any PD, we're always asking, you know, like, what are you using? What's new? What's out there? Because, you know, teachers are at the forefront. They're always looking for new, the mm-hmm. new thing, you know, and so listening to that. But on that topic of feedback, I want to give my single greatest piece of advice. Well, maybe not that, but <laughs> a really strong piece of advice <laughs> to teachers is, you know, tell your administration, tell your tech folks, you know, what you like, what you wish a tool, mm-hmm. you know, could get better. But every platform, or at least every platform that's worth using, has some sort of feedback mechanism Mm -hmm. from their users. So find that button and click it and tell the developers what you want a tool to be. Because, you know, I I talk to vendors, I talk to you guys, I talk to other folks out there. And it's, you know, one thing coming from me, but from the day in, day out teacher users, that's what hopefully you care about the most. Mm -hmm. So teachers, find that feedback button and tell your developers of your favorite tool exactly what you want. If there's a thing that you wish, like, oh, I just wish this thing did this one extra thing, tell them because they'll listen to you before they listen to me, or at least if they're doing it right. (laughs) Yeah, certainly. I mean, I know here at Screencastify, we're looking at every email that's sent. If you add us at Twitter and say, hey, we want you to add this thing or we want you to change this thing, then that is something that we are always looking at. And sometimes that even comes out in the development process, right? Like we might be thinking about something and we want to talk to teachers before it even is a thing to say, hey, what do you think of this? And often that has led to us changing a button or changing how something works. So I certainly think that there is a place for educators and folks who use tools to be able to provide feedback. And the cool thing is hopefully that permeates beyond education, right? So if you don't like the way your iPhone works, go tell Apple about it because somebody there is probably um, aggregating that feedback as well. Absolutely. And also, you know, I mean, I take feedback very seriously, you know, so I start, I tend to ramble and sometimes (laughs) teachers will tell me ramble and I'm like, okay, okay, we'll get better at that. I try, you know, we're, we're all on a journey. (laughs) Certainly. I want to backtrack just a hot second. I, Mm -hmm. as a teacher have had the opportunity to work in a super large district. I worked out in Miami, which I think might actually beat Chicago in terms of how large the district is. I could be wrong. We might be a little bit behind. We're right there on the verge. Yeah. It's three, four, you know, yeah. I think we'll, we'll either switch back and forth or something. All right. All right. Fair enough. We'll have to. We have to get the latest statistics to see who's winning that battle. But exactly. my point here is that I know you as a person and I know how much you care about feedback, but I think sometimes teachers in these BMF districts either don't know how to reach out to folks like you or don't know how to do it. Even if they know who you are, they have access to your email address or anything of that nature. Do you have yeah. any tips for folks who might work in these really large districts for getting in touch with folks like you or folks who sit in your office when they need a hand or they have feedback? Yeah, I mean, that is a very valid point. I mean, our our biggest event, we do Google Palooza every summer and right at the beginning of the pandemic, 10,000 teachers came. But prior to that, it's usually like, you know, 1,000, 1,500 teachers mm-hmm. that come. So not everybody knows about everything that's available. So to the teachers in the large districts, hopefully it's it's works this way. And in an ideal and semi-ideal world, it works this way. There's always one person at the building that knows. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whether it's your school's technology coordinator or librarian, or even like a principal or an AP, there's someone that knows that channel. And then the other thing is, I know, because I get this a lot when, you know, someone does reach out, you know, because I, I'm very available, rcarol2 at cps.edu, people <laughs> reach out to me, and, you know, I'll throw it out there. I'm terrible at social media, but I respond to emails and chats. And they almost invariably always begin, I know you're really busy, but, and yeah, I am busy, but I am never too busy to help a teacher Mm -hmm. do whatever they need. So don't be afraid to reach out. 
you know, that's, that's the other thing is, you know, a lot of teachers are hesitant, you know, they're like, oh, no, my, my problem is too small. I'll just live with it. And it's not, you know, whatever your problem is, it's important to you. So it's important to me. And uh, every district has those people. So ask around, you'll, you'll find them, but it, it can be hard in, in those big districts. I'm very well aware. Certainly. Well, if anybody in Chicago is listening, they've got the golden ticket. R. <laughs> Carol too at cps.edu. Uh, you <laughs> <laughs> might get a sleuth of emails or maybe people who can't find their person and they're wondering if you might yeah. be willing to adopt them. Hey, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, so I know that there is lots and lots of innovation coming from your office two teachers of Chicago, but I think that you have already alluded to lots of innovation going the opposite way. So teachers in schools who have a specific problem and come up with really, really innovative solutions to be able to solve those problems. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the innovative things that are happening throughout Chicago public schools and maybe how you go about amplifying some of those things that are happening at the small scale? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're screencastify here. So uh, I think <laughs> video is a great place to start, right? So, you know, if you think back on just making a video, mm -hmm. like even just a few years ago, complex tools, you need specialized equipment, it's hard. You know, I used to co-teach a broadcast journalism class and, you know, I was the tech angle of that one. And, you know, it was hard. There's a lot of like things to figure out, but the tools have gotten so much easier. Like Screencastify is simple. It's dead simple to just click that button and start recording. Now from that, you can get as crazy as you want, but for that basic thing, it's really so much easier than it ever has been. And so I think that's important. And, you know, this was one thing I said in the webinar as well, I believe, but, you know, I'm not a social media guy. I just really couldn't get into that. So don't be scared if you've never been on TikTok or anything, your kids are. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we leave a lot of creativity at the classroom door. And so... You know, that's one of those places where I think you can embrace some of those new ideas. I've seen some really awesome things from CPS educators doing like fake Snapchat stories to analyze and work with literature or like, you know, what would Jane Eyre tweet? What <laughs> I haven't seen, but I would love to see is like, you know, what would Ada Lovelace's YouTube channel look like, <laughs> right? Somebody out there do that one. I'm, I, that's, that one came to me this morning. I'm like, oh, I want to see that. But I have seen like the Jane Eyre, I've seen the fake mm -hmm. tweets, then the Snapchat things. And, you know, when we're creating, we're accessing all sorts of different parts of our mm -hmm. brain. And, and that's really where deep learning happens. And it can happen at every subject area, every grade level. You know, one of the things my background was working in high school, but now, you know, the position I'm in now, I get to see like kindergartners walking around with iPads you know, recording themselves, finding, you know, shapes and colors mm -hmm. and things. And that is just so powerful and so exciting. And it seems so simple, but yet it's really innovative because again, the more we practice makes permanent, right? The more that we, uh, as humans tell our stories, we, we learn deeper. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's true of, of all of us and especially of our students. So I don't know if I answered the question, but those are some of the things that uh, I've seen, you know, podcast, one of with the new CPS curriculum, there's intentionally built in some of these moments, like, you know, students making podcasts and, you know, as humans, we thrive on seeing and hearing other people talk and tell their stories, right? Otherwise YouTube wouldn't be so dang popular. <laughs> And so, yeah, so think about those things and, and, and bring them in. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember very vividly when I was teaching 11th grade, I had a student who I absolutely adored, who raised her hand one day and she said, Miss Dukes, 
all we do every day is write paragraphs. And at that point in my teaching career, I don't think that I thought about how students might be able to demonstrate their learning beyond this very tried and true method of writing this paragraph, engaging with literature in that way. And I think, obviously, in the moment, I was like, dang, you might be right. And also thinking a little bit about, okay, like, how do I change that? But I think it's so important to think about, okay, if I close my eyes for a second and I say, what are my students likely doing after they leave my class? I think that there are lots and lots of things that might come to mind. Maybe they're watching their favorite creators on YouTube. Maybe they're watching TikTok. They're going through Twitter. Maybe they're engaging with Reddit. All of these different places in which folks are sharing ideas in really different ways. And I think that you're so right that if we're able to infuse that level of creation in the classroom, then we increase engagement. And I think the other thing that is really, really important to me is thinking about how we assess what we want to assess. So the other thing that came to mind as I was listening to Diamond talk is I'm like, yeah, I want to assess how well you understand this novel that we just read, but without realizing I'm realizing it, I'm also assessing your ability to be able to write right and it's like those mm -hmm. two things are actually different and how do i decouple those two and sometimes the answer is in these more authentic learning experiences that we might be able to cultivate for students yeah absolutely all right i love it so we're gonna see a new youtube channel out of cps relatively soon <laughs> apparently um, and and lots and lots more innovation so it is not lost on me that a lot of what you talked about was centered around video and not necessarily just teacher created video. We talked a little bit about that, but also there's this other camp that is incredibly rich of students creating their own videos to be able to prove their learning, demonstrate their ideas and all of that. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you see video evolving, particularly in traditional classroom environments. And what I mean by that is I know we had lots and lots of conversation around video at the beginning of the pandemic when we had to because our students were at home and we were attempting to navigate this. But now as we transition back to the after times, if we're calling that the before times, <laughs> what, what do we do now? How do we continue to build on this idea of using video? Yeah, I mean, even even in the before times, you know, a lot of us were exploring those ideas of blended learning, right? Um, you know, entire companies have made their entire careers on that. So it's it's not new, mm -hmm. but after the intense tech boot camp that basically every educator in the world has gone through over this pandemic. We're now able to rethink some of that stuff and relook at it. And, uh, you know, shout out to this podcast and, and the webinar that I was on, I got to learn about the modern classroom project and the way mm. that they're thinking about moving that blended classroom idea in, in new directions as, as we've learned, you know, because full transparency, we all know, I, I experienced this with my broadcast journalism class, like. We would assign a video for them to watch at home and they would come back having not watched the video. So mm -hmm. then you're back in that rotation of, well, now I've got a lecture about this thing and, you know, it would have all been easier if you just watched the video. And some of that also, I think was just time and, and, and thinking about homework. Like that's a whole other subject that we could have. I do not want to go into that one, but. <laughs> you know, rethinking those ways that we're using video, right? Like, you know, teachers making a quick two minute screencast to save yourself from having to repeat something a billion times. I mean, that's how I got into video creation. Mm -hmm. I got tired of answering the same question a billion times. So, hey, here's a video. And making them, you know, really succinct, broken down to cover those basics, right? And then from the student angle, if you think about it, a really great video also requires 
writing. Mm, mm -hmm. Right? So you're actually, if you think about it, making the students work a little bit more if they're making their video because they have to have something written. I mean, we can't all just sit there and spitball, but, uh, you know, we've done it, but, but done really well, there is that aspect of, of writing involved as, as well. So I think it's one of those things that it's, it's definitely worth continuing. It's definitely worth digging deeper into and researching more mm -hmm. and finding those ways. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I'm so glad that you brought up some of the skills that are inherent in effective video creation that we might not think of. So writing down a script. I think the other one is when we think about students engaging in the edited, editing process, it's very similar to the revision process that I wanted my students to go through when they were writing an essay. How are they con effectively conveying those ideas and all of that, that we might be able to couch it in the fun stuff like, hey, don't you want to create a better video? But we're also teaching some of these really, really important skills that we might struggle to teach each otherwise. Well, and, and yeah, I, I agree a thousand percent with that. And then the other part of that too is, you know, we know, like you said, Reddit, YouTube, mm -hmm. all of the things is where our students are going, where we go, you know, if I need mm -hmm. to find something, I go to YouTube. But when you're making those in your classroom or for your classroom, that also builds community, right? Like mm. listening to an expert stranger is one thing, but it's even more powerful when it's a voice I trust and a face I know. So I think that's a key thing to start thinking about when you know you as a teacher are starting to think about making videos. Don't worry about making you know crazy graphics and all of that stuff. Just talk to your students, and and that helps mm -hmm. build community. And then when your yeah. students are talking back to you, you get to learn more about them. For sure. We, we had a guest on the podcast who talked about a video that she created where right in the middle, her husband asked what was for dinner. And she decided, you know what? I'm not gonna edit that out because I'm tired and I'm just gonna put it out to kids. And what happened was instead of kids kind of being like, oh, another humdrum video, they're like, so what'd you make for dinner? And it created this really <laughs> interesting place for yeah. connection that would not have happened without that video, right? Like now you get to talk about some of your favorite yeah. foods and what, what did the kid have for dinner and all of these authentic connections that we know actually improve learning. So I, I think that there certainly is a, an element of that, of allowing this vulnerability that is inherent in video creation and that improving student-teacher relationships. I love that you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so true. That little bit of just humanity and peeking mm -hmm. into your life as a person can be so impactful and so powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I was always in an uphill battle to prove to my students that I didn't just like go to sleep after the bell rung and then I magically rise again when the bell <laughs> rings the next day. It's exactly. like, yeah. I'm a real person, guys, I promise. Uh, and that's one of the things too, my, my team, my teammate and I do occasionally leave mistakes when we're like doing a tutorial, just to show it's okay. Like, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to click that button. Here's what it does. Okay, now let's go back and here's mm. the button I meant to click. Because that also just shows, you know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. And, and sometimes capturing those in the moment is, is can be cool. For sure. So I want to talk about this other video initiative or curriculum initiative that y'all have going on right, right now at CPS, which is called Skyline. And yeah. it is Chicago's first ever universal curriculum that is accessible to all CPS educators. So for those of us who are not familiar with Skyline, can you tell us a little bit about what it does and what it's going to make possible for teachers and students? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, you know, my journey from break fix to instructional technology <laughs> really hinges here. So mm. about three or four years ago, our chief education officer at the time, Latanya McDade, 
really sat down and looked at the inequality in our district, right? Hmm. Um, a third grade classroom on the south side looked completely different than a third grade classroom on the north side as a broad mm -hmm. generalization, right? Obviously, there's pockets everywhere of amazing things and pockets of not amazing things, but it's real disservice, especially at a district our size, that there are schools that are, and pardon me for saying this, but there are schools that are failing our students, and it's not for lack of trying, right? It's often a lack of resources. So starting to look at this giant question, uh, she started what was called the Curricula Curriculum Equity Initiative at the time, and hmm. set up this new department of which instructional technology was a part of it. I jumped at this and I've been thrilled to be a part of this work um, ever since. And so starting from the point of, okay, what do we need? And obviously curriculum being the main thing in a district our size, we haven't had a district mandated central curriculum for at least as long as I've been here for a decade, I'm sure it goes way back. Um, and so, okay, let's start with that. But how do we get it out there? So digital and technology came in, but not all of our schools had devices. So that became part of it. And it's this really restructuring the entire way that we as a district do business um, of looking at tools, looking at devices, upgrading you know, the network. We've got a major project that's also happening in, in tandem with this to upgrade every school's bandwidth um, throughout the city. Hmm. And it's really about access and um, you know, bringing resources everywhere. Hmm. Now, I do not recommend launching a new curriculum during a pandemic, <laughs> but at the same time, it also felt wrong to not start now when we've got most of the pieces in place. So the version 1.0 launched uh, this fall. So mm -hmm. we're about to end the first semester. Um, for realizing all of these things, it was an opt-in model right now. So there's a, about 5,000 educators that are adopting in at least one curriculum area right now, hmm. um, kind of helping us define it, right? Sure. So not only is it digital, but the really exciting part is all of the folks involved were tasked with ensuring that the curriculum is you know, standards aligned, high quality, you know, all of the buzzwords, but also culturally relevant to Chicago. Hmm. Simple things as basic as, you know, the images that are shown, the examples, um, you know, the reading materials, it's all reflective of Chicago in all of its vast multiculturalness, mm -hmm. um, which is really amazing to see, right? <laughs> um, obviously, the 1.0 version, it's just the base. Um, so we've got another group starting up here shortly that's called the Curriculum Collaborative, which is a group of those teachers who have been using it this year. Mm -hmm. We're going to work with them to kind of tweak and adapt and and build out even more resources and materials. Um, you know, my team, I mentioned podcasting is one of the things that was written into the uh, curriculum, making sure that we have all of those tools in place. You know, as a district, we have both Chromebooks and iPads. Mm -hmm. So making sure that I've got all of the materials so a teacher can walk in and know how to do podcasting on a Chromebook or an iPad or you know, anything else that they've got. Um, so those sorts of things, um, you know, it's really frustrating and scary work, but it's important work. And I'm so thrilled to be this tiny part of it um, and so excited for the future of Chicago um, with this. Yeah, for sure. It, it sounds like you started with this question that is huge around how huge. we create equity. Um, and honestly, Ron, we probably could talk for the next seven days without sleeping about educational equity and still yeah. not arrive at really, Absolutely. really good conclusions. Yeah. But 
what's interesting about this question and how CPS has approached it is that it feels almost like an onion. And as you pull back layers, you realize that there is more and more that you've got to do. So it starts maybe with equity and curriculum, but then you found this problem of bandwidth and you found this problem of devices. And then you've dealt with this idea of how do we implement this and create teacher buy-in so that today 5,000 CPS educators are engaging with this curriculum, but theoretically we're moving toward a world where every CPS educator has access to it. And how do we make sure that that happens? Can Can you talk a little bit about some of the feedback that you've gotten from some of the teachers who have started to use a Skyline curriculum? Yeah, I mean, you know, and this is where my team really comes in because (laughs) we are tech integrationists. We are tech Mm -hmm. people. We love tech. But we also are deeply aware that not every person on the planet loves technology the way we do. Right. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, handholding and just, you know, going back to those earlier questions of like that fear factor, right. Mm-hmm. Um, so working with that, you know, trying to develop some of mind shift changes, you know, uh, also coming on the tail of the pandemic, you know, mm-hmm. teachers are tired of staring at screens. So it's like when they hear that it's a curriculum that's available digitally. They're like, I just want to print it out and go back to paper. That's all I want. (laughs) And, you know, there are options for that in in places, but, um, you know, it being digital means that we can make those tweaks in real time, um, Mm -hmm. you know, so always the most update version available versus, you know, the old textbooks, which can be out of date within, you know, especially if you're talking tech textbooks, like any any technology here can be out of date within a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, we're a Google district. How many times does Google move a button without telling anybody? <laughs> um, so there's those things. And, and one of the ways that we're addressing this is, um, you know, my team developed uh, the Skyline Systems Training, which is a mm-hmm. series of asynchronous modules. Um, so again, showing what that can look like. They're all based around performance tasks. So you're actually doing something with the tool set. Um, but we also have virtual in-person, you know, synchronous sessions to help those, you know, those folks out. But having those different modalities and, and availability of the training materials um, has been super cool. There are also micro credentials and huge digital badge advocates. Um, we can have a whole conversation around that as well. But uh, it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard thing. It's it's mm-hmm. hard work, you know get excited and then, uh, you know, I'm frustrated and sad all at the same time when, you know, it's like, I just want to, I just want a worksheet. I know, but if you take your worksheet and you tweak it like this and you do this, yeah, I don't have time for that. So that's where, again, having it be, uh, and this is where that curriculum collaborative piece is going to really come in and be awesome for the future is having teachers develop those additional materials as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, And, you know, the places where in the 1.0, you know, maybe it didn't have enough for uh, our diverse learner population, or it didn't have enough to access for our English language learners and having educators who have struggled with that go, okay, Mm -hmm. we just need this piece. And then having that immediately be in the curriculum, that's, that's exciting. So it's scary, it's frustrating, but ultimately it's the right thing to do. For sure. And I want to ask you one more question here. Yeah. And and I appreciate you kind of peeling back the layers here because I think yeah. the elephant in the room is what if you spend all of this time on something that you think is really good and it flops because yeah. teachers don't like it or students don't like it or insert stakeholder here is not fully invested in it. So yeah. I, I love this idea of really piloting the idea and seeing what happens. I'm curious, how did you all ensure that the folks who are in that pilot group are actually representative of teachers throughout CPS? So how did you make sure that you had teachers on the west side, on the south side, on the north side, that you had teachers of all curriculums, that you had teachers who are working with diverse learners, with ELL populations, so on and so forth, insert demographic here. Yeah. So, you know, that's where, and I do sometimes laugh at the name Skyline. Um, 
we have a being a large district we actually do have a really great marketing department um, which is a weird thing to say i i completely understand that <clears throat> i still find it weird as well um but they were really instrumental in helping you know with that branding and mm -hmm. with that you know sales pitch right um so that is a part of it of getting the message out across the district um, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Um, you know, getting all of the, we've got some great splashy videos. If you go in and, <laughs> and look them up, um, that they did a really great job on. Um, but ultimately it comes down to really that, uh, we all know we need this, right? Mm. Because the other great thing about this is it's completely free to the schools. And typically in the model that CPS had before, each school was purchasing like their own curriculum materials. Mm -hmm. So there is an economic incentive as well to go, oh, this has everything I need. And in some cases it doesn't. And that's where, you know, mm -hmm. the continual improvement comes in. But it's almost a no brainer of I can pay for this that, you know, may or may not be as great as this. So that was one aspect of it. Um, we did a lot of uh, tours around the, the district talking to, to teachers and, and really listening as well um, you know, in the early stages. Mm -hmm. So again, this didn't come out of nowhere. It's been three plus years of just constantly talking about it. Um, in the early, early days, I had a group um, called the CPS Technology Trailblazers and they were the first ones to get access to all of the tools. So they were playing around and generating that kind of groundswell. Um, but it wasn't entirely a top-down thing. And I think that was really mm -hmm. important. You know, This was coming from a place of teachers knew they needed stuff and they were asking for stuff. And so making that conscious effort to deliver the best possible things and mm -hmm. knowing that it's going to constantly change. So I don't think that answered your question, but there was a lot of marketing push around it, you know, a lot of sales trying to just get people on board. And, I, uh, but yeah, it varies. We are, those 5,000 teachers are spread out around the district. And, and also working in PLCs, you know, mm -hmm. across content area, you know, within the same content and grade band. So also hopefully developing, um, some greater collaboration around the district. For sure. I I think it does answer the question. And I I actually don't know if we should shy away from this idea of engaging in marketing. Certainly for folks in your position, you are marketing <clears throat> new ideas to educators. And I don't think that the life of a classroom practitioner does not involve marketing either. We are we're doing that day by day to try to engage our students. We might call it something different, certainly, but we are master marketers in attempting to get students on board and invested in the things that we talk about. So it's interesting that that plays a role in how we get a diverse population of testers, how we roll things out and everything that your office is doing to move um, uh, education forward. Yeah. It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't envy you. I don't know if anybody <laughs> listening is like, Hey, I would like his job. Uh, I think we're all well, like, that's where the fun comes <laughs> in, right? You gotta make it fun. <laughs> uh, fair enough. All right. So before we wrap up our discussion, we have a segment here where we ask every single one of our heroes to share some tips for teachers. So I want to ask you one more time, how might teachers work with someone in your position? If you had to distill it down to one tip, how can educators get in touch with instructional technology leaders and really make sure that they're able to improve their practice? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, I've hinted at this before. I'm going to just go out and straight up say it. My wife's a high school English teacher, and one of her classroom catchphrases is no judgment, no fear. Like okay. She's constantly trying to get her kids to be courageous in their writing. And 
it's the same thing. I've adopted it as well. Be fearless. Mm. Um, don't be afraid to reach out. No matter what district you're in, there is a tech coach somewhere. And all of us got into this gig because we care about these things. You know, you don't become a technology integration coach without loving to work with people and technology and, and really caring. That's why we get into this gig. So mm -hmm. find those people and don't be afraid to ask them questions. Um, but also use all the resources out there. I'm going to give a shout out to one of my heroes, Eric Kurtz. If you're mm. not subscribed to Control Alt Achieve, you're missing out on not only the best beard in the game, <laughs> but great tips and tricks and a wonderful voice. I could listen to him all day. Uh, Matt Miller's Ditch That Textbook is incredible. Mm -hmm. And even if you have no interest in spreadsheets, I highly recommend everyone go on binlcollins.com. Ben Collins is a Google Sheets expert that will completely change your life around spreadsheets. So a couple of <laughs> plugs there for some of my heroes. Um, but again, just remembering, you know, the word of advice is find that one thing, that one problem mm -hmm. of practice. Don't try to do everything all at once. Just find that one thing and work on that and then keep working on that and practice will make permanent. Yeah, I love it. So find one thing, check out a few resources. They are abundant online and find your person. And if you're like me, you can even throw in that millennial, don't judge me, but I have a question um, to that person who cares yeah. a whole heap of a lot about how you might integrate technology in your classroom. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Ron, I really appreciate you joining Ed Tech Heroes. And listeners, be sure to follow Ron at rcarol2003. Although you might not see a ton of tweets. Not you a can ton of tweets. <laughs> but you can reach me on there. I, I'll answer DMs. <laughs> all right. All right. Fair enough. So you heard it. You'll at least get a DM uh, from him. <laughs> I am your host, Neff Dukes, and I am looking forward to seeing each and every one of you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of EdTech Heroes, presented by Screencastify.